Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Fred McMurray, Valley, and Frank Sinatra in The Miracle of the Bells. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. It's not often that you can see the film version of a book on the screen that's still on the bestseller list throughout the country. And it's not often that we can broadcast the screenplay of a story that's still being read in thousands, if not millions, of homes. But such is our good fortune tonight with Lasky McEwen's current film production of Russell Janney's book, The Miracle of the Bells. And we bring it to you now with three great stars, Fred McMurray, Valley, and Frank Sinatra playing their original screen roles. Many of the scenes in The Miracle of the Bells were filmed on actual location in a typical Pennsylvania mining village. And from such a place, close to the setting of tonight's play, as a matter of fact, comes a letter from a good friend of this theater. She writes, In a town where soot and smoke are almost unavoidable, it's always a problem taking care of your complexion. But with Lux Soap, I have never had trouble keeping my skin looking fresh and lovely. We appreciate Lux Soap as much as we enjoy your Monday evening broadcasts, and that's saying a great deal. Well, as one way of saying thanks to this kind listener, we raise our curtain on Act One of RKO's current hit release, The Miracle of the Bells, starring Fred McMurray as Bill Dunnigan, Valley as Olga, and Frank Sinatra as Father Paul. A few moments ago, an eastbound train paused momentarily in a small Pennsylvania town. One passenger got off, while from the baggage car, a coffin was quickly unloaded and placed in an awaiting hearse. You, Mr. Dunnigan? Yes. I'm the undertaker, Mr. Dunnigan. Nick Orloff. Might as well ride with me back to Coal Town. Thank you. You, uh, you the husband of the deceased? No, I'm... I'm just a friend. Mm. Quite surprised when I got your telegram. Never had a client from Hollywood before. Uh, the name of the deceased, Mr. Dunnigan, Olga Treskovna. That was her professional name. She was an actress. But she come from Coal Town, huh? Uh, what was her real name? Olga Trocky. Trocky? Stan Trocky's kid? That's right. Three years ago, I gave Stan Trocky a first-class $100 funeral. You think she paid me? Not a penny, not one cent. What are you stopping here for? I ain't burying any more deadbeats until they pay up. You mean now? Right now. All right, Mr. Orloff. But it was a $90 funeral, not a hundred. She paid you ten, she told me. Here, give me $20 change. Oh, no. What about the extras? Flowers and six pallbearers at two bucks apiece. I'm a respectable businessman. I never cheated nobody. When I say a hundred bucks, it's a hundred bucks. My mistake, Mr. Orloff, not noticing your fine qualities. Now get us to Coal Town. It's all right, Olga. You'll be home soon. But why anyone should want to come back to this flea-bitten end of the world, I don't know. But that's what you wanted. And it's all I can do for you, kid. Ride with you and tell you that I love you. That's what's driving me crazy. That I waited till now to tell you. I love you, Olga. I guess I loved you the first time I saw your face. I'll never forget how I happened to meet you. I'd heard Tommy Elmore was rehearsing a new review. And as long as I was in the neighborhood... No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. What are you dames trying to do to me? You, you, what's your name? Olga Triscovna. Well, look, Olga, I'm sorry, but I haven't time for beginners. Come back when you've learned something. Mr. Elmore, please, No, no, I'm sorry, but this show's got to go on in four days. Let me try again. Please, give me another chance. Go on, Tommy, give the kid a break. Huh? Who's that? Bill, Bill Dunn again. How are you, Tommy? Just thought I'd drop in and say hello. Hey, uh, can you get out of here? I'll buy you a drink. Girls, meet the world's greatest press agent. Bill, meet the world's worst chorus. Hiya, girls. Hi. Okay, ladies, take half an hour. Oh, if you've been watching them, Bill, you know I could use a drink. <laughs> hey, uh, Tommy, 
Do me a favor, huh? Huh? Yeah, shoot, pal. Let the piano player work with that kid. He'll have her dancing like Pablo in no time. You know her? All oh, right, just like her face. She looks like she needs the job. Come on, Tommy, give her a break. Okay. Freddy, see what you can do with Alga. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Now, never mind the thanks. Just learn that routine. Oh, I will. I will. That's where it began, Olga. And this is where it ends. In Orloff's funeral parlor. You're back in Coal Town, baby. Now, if you'll just sit down, Mr. Dunnigan. Well, sir, we can give her a fine funeral for 150 bucks. Of course, Paul bears will be extra. Oh, get them. Two bucks apiece. Now, about the church. First thing for me to do is fix it up with Father Spinsky. So just make yourself comfortable, Mr. Dunnigan. Be back as soon as I see you. What a sap I was, baby. Walking out of that theater with Tommy Elmore not seeing you again for a whole year. And then only by accident. That tank town in Iowa. Christmas Eve. And me wondering how to kill time till my train left. I walked down Main Street. And there was your picture. In the lobby with the rest of the cast. The show was over, but I took a chance you'd still be in your dressing room. Mr. Donegan. <laughs> You've got a good memory. Oh, come in. Come in. Oh, I've wanted so to see you. This is the most exciting thing that could have happened. I wanted to see you to thank you. I've never forgotten how kind you were. <laughs> then you finally learned that dance routine, huh? I became so good in the chorus that now I'm a great dramatic actress. Oh? <laughs> it's not a good play, and I don't have a good part. But I love it, and I'm so grateful to you. But what are you doing in Iowa? I'm an advance man for a road show. Well, I, I see you're ready to leave. You've got a date, huh? I just wanted to drop in and say hello. Oh, I, I don't have any date, Mr. Donegan. You're not going anywhere? Just to the hotel. I suppose you're with friends. I won't keep you, Mr. Donegan. The name is Bill, and you are going somewhere with me. Are you hungry? Yes. Wonderful. There may, must be some restaurant in town that's still open. Come on, let's find it. Walking with you in the snow, I felt as though I were drunk and didn't know what it was. I didn't know that I'd feel the same everywhere, every time I was with you. We finally found a Chinese restaurant. It was deserted. But old Ming Gao seemed to think we were very special customers. You shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Ming Gao. But how delicious everything was. Uh, after all, it is Christmas. And you say you are strangers here. Who met purely by accident. No. Uh, no accident. I believe these things are all written. And we just follow the script, huh? <laughs> yes, we follow. Uh, maybe you will tell me something, young lady. Uh, your name. Olga Trocki, alias Olga Triskovna. Trocki, huh? Eh? Olga, when did you first decide to be an actress? When I was a little girl, I think. In a place called Coal Town, Little Poland. Oh, near Wilkes Wilkesbury? Yes. Coal Town killed my mother. My father, too. My father was very sweet and kind. He played the accordion and sang. And he used to say to me when he had a hangover, which was most of the time, go away someplace, Olga, and sing and dance and act and be happy. So you followed his advice? Huh? Except I'm nobody. But I'll be ready when my chance comes. I think maybe in Hollywood. <laughs> Not so fast, baby. What you need is a couple of years in stock. You've got a lot to learn. I haven't time for all that, Bill. I want to get there quickly. And when I am a big star and the interviewers ask me, how did this great success come to you, Olga Truskovna? I'll tell them it came from Bill Dunnigan, who once said, give the kid a break. <laughs> well, I, I think we'd better go, Bill. It's late. Yeah. Uh, let's have the check, Ming. No, no check. Oh, no check. Come on, come on. We ate the whole restaurant. <laughs> Please, let this humble meal be my gift to the two guests from far away. Well, thanks, Ming. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Oh, wait. This is for you, Mingao. It's nothing, just a little religious medal, St. Michael, the Archangel. Will you take it, please? I am very grateful. St. Michael, huh? What's his specialty? Fighting for God. He is a very gallant saint, Bill. Uh, I will carry it and hope for your great success, Miss. Good night, Mingao. Well, it stopped snowing. Yes. And look up there. Bill, look. Look up there. Are the stars? Yes. Do you see over there where that V-shaped cluster is? Now, just to the right of it. Oh, yeah. See that bright one? Yeah. It's mine. 
My star. Yours, huh? <laughs> My father told me that star appeared for the first time the night I was born. Well, could be. It's there every night to remind me of where I'm going. Oh, I'm being very silly. I won't see you again for a long time, maybe. Will you accept a Christmas present from a strange lady? My star up there. I'll give you half. Yes, Bill. Half is for you. Why didn't I say something to you then? But no, not a word. Not even where can I write you, where will you be? No, no. Old Clammouth just walking along with his heart jumping and never a word. And now I'm in Nick Orloff's funeral parlor. And you in a box in the corner of the room. But it can't end like this, baby. It can't end with Dunnigan the dummy just staring at a box. You and... see? That didn't take long, did it? Me and Father Spinsky got everything worked out fine. And I got hold of a singer, too. Now, let's see. I figure a blanket of roses for the coffin. And maybe a nice wreath as a sort of personal tribute from you. Oh, yeah. And the section of the church. I almost forgot that. Oh, that's bad. You wouldn't want to forget any charges. Huh? And a donation for Father Spinsky's church. Let's figure on a total of 350 bucks. 350? Well, that's a lot more than... That I... ain't much for a service at St. Leo's. At St. Leo's? Yes, sir. Biggest church in town. But that's the wrong church. I wanted St. Michael's. I just took for granted. That, that old broken-down barn? Oh, no. You don't want your friend buried from St. Michael's. Look, Mr. Orloff. Where is St. Michael's? Go on. Take a look at it. I ain't worried. Down the street to your left. Across from the hotel. Just remember, Father Paul ain't got anything to offer. You'll be back. So that's why I'm here, Father Paul. She wanted to be buried from your church. Now, how much do you charge? I'd, uh... I better tell you first, she wanted a few extras. I'm very proud that this girl wanted to be buried from St. Michael's, Mr. Dunnigan. Please put your money away. I'm sorry, Father. I came in here like a sorehead. It's just that... Well, it's a pleasure to run into a human being again. You ever hear of poverty, Father? Oh, yes. Poverty is an old friend of St. Michael's. Well, I'm down to my last $300. I just thought I'd better warn you. And I've got a favor to ask. Could we have her brought here? I hate the thought of Olga being left in Orloff's place. Well, of course, she belongs here. Let me phone Orloff, and then you must tell me about Olga. I can see you must have loved her very much. Oh, Nick Orloff's a stupid and greedy man. But she'll be here. Thank you, Father. Now, about, about Olga. Well... I'd met her only twice before I took a job in Hollywood as personal drum beater for the great Marcus Harris. Marcus Harris? Uh, Marcus Harris is one of the greatest motion picture producers in America. And at the moment, he was giving given birth to a $3 million epic called Joan of Arc. The star of the picture was a girl named Anna Klovna. But Miss Klovna proved quite a problem. She was troubled from the minute she walked into the studio. Then one morning in Harris's office... I refuse to perform... I will not put my foot on that set again. I'm leaving, Mr. Harris. Miss Clovener, please. That imbecile. He's a director. He's an idiot. He wants me to be here before I'm awake. He says I must rehearse. I have played Joan in Europe. Shaw's Joan. Schiller's Joan. What have I to learn from him? From any of you? Oh, come on, come on, Anna. Don't act like this. You're a great artist. Why, well, then I want to be treated like a great artist. Uh, let's go to your dressing room. Let's see if we can't talk this over, huh? So, now you give the order, too. What do you know about art? A pushcart peddler is what you were. And what you still are. No ignorant peasant can give orders to Anna Club. Now, wait a minute. We don't talk like that in America. No. All you talk in America is money, money, money. Oh, but I am finished. I quit. You can quit. I... I'm sorry you don't like me, Miss Klovener. That's all right. I'm sorry you don't like America. But that isn't all right. It's too bad you couldn't see something nice in such a wonderful place. Wonderful. For fools, maybe. For money grabbers. For peddlers. I am an artist. Uh, she'll calm down, Marcus. She'll be back. I don't want her back. I like this country. I won't work with anyone who doesn't like it. Well, you can get somebody else to play the part, then. There's no one else available who can play Joan of Arc. 
It's too bad. Clover has a great talent. Well, let's walk over to the set and give him the bad news. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We're forced to give up the picture. I'm sorry this has happened. Maybe we'll have better luck next time. That's it, boys. Wrap it up. Mr. Donegan. Bill. Bill. Holy Ike, am I dreaming? Hello, Bill. Olga, don't tell me you're in pictures. I was. I just lost my job. I was standing for Anna Klovna. You're working here, too? Yeah. Look, uh, let's get out of here where we can talk. So you a stand-in, huh? Not much of a job for a foolish young lady who dreamed of being a star. <laughs> you know, it, it makes me happy just to look at you. Say, where can I meet you tonight? Let me cook dinner for you. I've got a sort of apartment, and I've been dying to have a guest. No guest? No. I'm glad. What's the address? 1461 Curzon Avenue. It's over a garage. 1461. Oh, will it be all right if I get there about 7 o'clock? 7 is fine. Oh, Bill, how good to see you again. More coffee, Bill? Oh, no, thanks. Just tell me the rest of it, baby. Oh, there isn't any rest of it. I kept making the rounds of the studios, and sometimes they said, come back, and sometimes they said, don't come back. But whatever they said, it always ended the same way. No job for a new young movie star. Bill, you're not listening. Yeah, I'm listening, baby. I'm listening to a lot of things. Olga, can you act? But you know I can act. How do I know? Because I told you. Oh, that's right, so you did. And I'm much better now. I, I spend all my spare time reading plays, learning parts, and... Yeah, you're better looking than she is, too. Who? Anna Klovna. You're younger, you're prettier. Bill, what are you talking Take about? Take it easy, baby. I'm incubating. Bill, you... You don't mean Joan of Arc. Never mind what I mean. Olga, do you know any scenes from the script? Oh, Bill, I, I know the whole script. Look, I don't want the whole script. I want one scene, one big scene. No? Yes, now. We've got to work fast. It's one of those things. Yes, Bill? Okay. You're on. The camera's rolling. Action. It, it's a scene where Joan comes into the courtroom. They brought her up from the dungeon. She sees all the great English aristocrats, all the great doctors of theology. They're here to make her confess that she has lied and blasphemed. Then the bishop asks her if, if she considers herself in a state of grace. And she replies, if I am not, I hope. God will put me there. And if I am, I hope he'll keep me there. They want the truth, they tell her. And they ask, when did Satan first command you to slay the English? And Joan answers, the voices of my saints commanded me to fight for France. So I went into battle, and I led the battles. And what were the English doing on the soil of France? Why didn't they keep their blood at home where French swords could not spill it? No, no, whatever you do to me, I will not say what is not the truth. And the truth is, I'm a peasant girl, and I love my mother and father and my brothers, and I would have stayed at home. But God spoke to me through his angel Michael, and he told me to go out into the world and help my people. I went, and I fought. And if I should escape from here, I, I will continue to fight for them. And if I do not escape and you, you will burn me for what I've done, I will kneel in the fire and give God my thanks for his kindness to me and my people. Okay. Okay, baby. Uh, where, where's the phone? Was, was it all right? Yeah, you? yeah, yeah, it was all right. Hello. Uh, Mr. Harris, please. It's Bill Dunnigan calling. Yeah, will you please? Bill, Bill, I, I don't know if you should... Hello, Marcus. It's Bill Dunnigan. Marcus, hang on to your hat. Uh, what? All right, all right. Hang on to your pajamas then. Look, Marcus, you don't have to shelve the picture. I found another Anna Clovna plus. She's young. She's beautiful. She's... Can she act? Can Hybitz fiddle? Can Joe Lewis fight? Can Bob Feller pitch? I'm telling you, Marcus, she's great. You've got to give her a screen test first thing in the morning. Just give me your okay and I'll set everything up. Yeah. Sure, sure, I've got her tied up. I give you my solemn word of honor. Yeah, fine. I'll see you tomorrow. Bill. Relax, baby. I'm going to explode. You're going to bed. It's like the time you came into the theater. I couldn't see you at first. 
Just a voice that said, give the kid a break. I don't know why I deserve anybody like you. Yeah, yeah. I've got to get hold of Dolan and talk him into directing the test. We don't want a shot by some stooge. I'll go and see him now. And you're going to get some sleep. How can I ever repay you, Bill? By knocking him dead, baby. Tomorrow's the big day. Not as big as now. Oh, Bill, thanks. Good night, Olga. Good night. Now, don't worry about anything. I'll see you on the barricades at dawn, baby. In a moment, we'll continue with Act Two of The Miracle of the Bells. Meanwhile, greetings to Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Fresh from the green grass of Wyoming, Mr. Keeley. You mean, of course, the picture of that name, Libby. Mm-hmm. 20th Century Fox's new western. And wasn't I surprised to see little Peggy Cummins in the role of a hard-riding outdoor girl. She's so dainty and feminine. Green grass of Wyoming is certainly full of action. Those harness races had me on the edge of my chair. <laughs> Especially the one with Charles Coburn at the reins. You can always count on Charles to give a rare performance. And I think the studio has a find in young Bob Arthur. Oh, he's most appealing as Peggy Cummins' sweetheart. I understand Peggy made a great hit when the company was on location. Mm -hmm. She was entertained by the governor and interviewed by all the papers. She's very lovely with her blonde hair and fresh, fair skin. How about that, John Kennedy? Yes, yeah, she's one of Hollywood's prettiest... No wonder everyone fell in love with her. Besides, Libby, Lux girls always make a hit. Yes, Peggy Cummins is an ardent Lux girl. She told me that during the war days in England, she used to cherish every sliver of Lux soap. Those Lux soap facials are wonderful for the skin, she said. I didn't want to neglect my complexion care a single day. Screen stars just can't take chances with complexion beauty. And neither should any woman. Lux facials are so easy and quick, and they really work. Tests by skin specialists prove it. In actually three out of four cases, skin became lovelier in a short time. Lux soap agrees with delicate skin. It's as fine a soap as money can buy. Fastidious women love the Lux soap perfume, too. It's such a delicate fragrance. Another reason why fragrant white Lux toilet soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. Back now to Mr. William Keeley. Two of The Miracle of the Bell, starring Fred McMurray as Bill Dunnigan, Valley as Alga, and Frank Sinatra as Father Paul. In the shabby old rectory of St. Michael's Church, the mild little priest, Father Paul, listens attentively as Bill Dunnigan, press agent, continues the story of Alga Truskovna. Well, Father, the screen test was great. Olga was wonderful. And when we started shooting, she was even better. Everyone was raving about her. No gags either, real raves. I tell you, Father, you've never seen a dream come true like this one. It sounds wonderful. Well, that should be Mr. Orloff. Come in. Where do you want the box? Would you carry it into the church, please? I got it uncrated for you. Yes, yes, you may keep the lumber, Mr. Orloff. That don't pay me. There's an extra charge. Five bucks. Here. Five bucks. Now beat it. You're going to hear from Father Spinsky? Yes, sir. I'm always happy to hear from Father Spinsky. Mr. Dunnigan, it's time for evening devotions. Would you care to come with me? In church? Oh, I... Uh, I don't know, Father. I... Well, please come and see her there. Well, for a minute. And you haven't finished telling me about her? Tomorrow, maybe. Good. And if you'd like, I'll show you the cemetery. This way, Mr. Dunnigan. You know, some people object to our cemetery being way up here in the hills, Mr. Dunnigan. But at least this is one place where the coal dust doesn't blow and where the flowers are always clean. I, uh, I asked a friend if she had ever heard of Alga Cheskovna, the movie actress... She said she hadn't. I told her she was very famous. No, Father. They wouldn't let her become famous. But why not? What happened? Well, after two weeks of shooting, Marcus Harris tripled her salary. That's how good she was. But she never changed. It's quite a thing, you know, Father, to jump from nowhere into stardom. And all the time she was getting thinner and more tired. I figured she was just working too hard. Until one day in her dressing room... I've never worked so hard in all my life. 
Dolan's a regular slave driver, but I love him for it. Oh, I feel as light as air. Clara, does she have a fever? She's awfully hot, Mr. Dunnigan. Oh, you would be too, under those lights all day. Let's have a wonderful party, Bill, when the picture's over. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that, baby. Poor, serious Bill. He doesn't know how gay life can be. How what? What? <laughs> Mr. Dunnigan, that bottle, please, her medicine. Here, dear, take this. Here. What uh, medicine is that? Just something Dr. Jennings gave me. Dr. Jennings? I've been using my voice so much lately. All those long speeches. But just think, Bill. Only three more days and the picture will be finished. Yeah. Well, uh, I've got to go and see Harris. Uh, be careful, baby. You, you look so tired, you frightened me. She doesn't know I've come here, Dr. Jennings. Tell me, how sick is she? She's very sick. She's developed tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? I see. She needs what we call surgical rest. Should have had it long ago. Well, if we could send her to a sanatorium now... I've but... tried desperately to persuade her, but she's determined to finish this picture even if it kills her. Yeah, I know, I know. But she will get well. There's always a chance, Mr. Duncan. No more than that, huh? Thanks for telling me, Doctor. And in spite of her illness, Mr. Dunnigan, she finished the picture? Yes, Father Paul, she finished it. I was in her dressing room just before they shot the final scene. I did my best to persuade her to postpone it. But it's just one more shot, Bill. Then it's finished. But the I'll... whole picture. You're not well, Olga. I've talked to Marcus. He said we can shoot it tomorrow or the next day or next week. Please, Bill. This is so important to me. Please. We're ready, Mr. Skobner. Coming. Come along, Bill. I want you to be there. Sure, baby. Sure. Yes, this was the last shot, Father Paul. With Olga as Joan chained to the stake, the fire leaping up around her, and the mob hooting and jeering until Joan spoke her last words. here. I pardon you for what you do. I'm young and I, I do not know much of life, but I know that this little place in which I stand is not the world. There are places I've never seen where men and women are full of sweetness and hope. I speak to them out of the pain that comes. Dream on. Dream on of God and goodness. Believe in truth and justice, for the word is yours. I will not die. I will not die. When the fire burns me, my soul will remain to sing the glory of God. I will remain as a light, a light for those in the dark. Why, Jesus, mercy. The following day, Olga was dead. A few hours later in Harris's office... So I've decided not to release the picture, gentlemen. Sometime, maybe we can remake it when we can find the proper person to play the part again. Marcus, you can't do that. I'm not going to release a picture with a dead girl in it, and that's final. But... Olga died to make it. She gave up her life to act in it. Where's your heart, Marcus? Do it for her. I'm sorry, Bill, I can't. If Olga had been a girl whom the public had known and loved, I might be willing to take a chance. But this way, no. We gambled and lost. That's all, gentlemen. Bill, I'm sorry. She was a fine girl. I'm going to take her home, Marcus. Back to Pennsylvania. That's what she wanted. I won't be coming back. You'll be back. It's tough, but it'll pass. Everything does. I don't think so. It can't end like this. Not for her. But that's the way it did end, Father Paul. 
The picture shelved. Olga's talent and beauty stuck away in a vault, buried like we're going to bury her. Those bells, Father. Church bells? Yes, they ring every day at noon all over the world. The Angelus. I guess I never listened. Bells? I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Olga wanted your bells rung at her funeral. I almost forgot her last request. I'll tell the sexton. Father, how many churches are there in Coal Town? Why, we, we have five churches. Do they all have bells? Well, yes, fine bells. Mr. Dunnigan, you're not thinking I'm of the... thinking of a lot of things. Five churches. Okay, I want all the bells to start ringing at 8 o'clock tonight and keep on ringing for three days. Three days and three nights. But why? A brain cell moved, finally. I've been letting all go down. I've been sitting around moaning like a beggar on a rainy day. Mr. Dunnigan, it's going to cost money, a lot of money. Oh, that'll be taken care of, Father. But you told me that you Look, only... Look, Father, you've heard of St. Michael, haven't you? He was a scrapper, wasn't he? Oh, indeed he was. He was the first warrior of heaven. Well, then what are we worried about? He's on our side, isn't he? Come on, Father, let's get back to town. You, uh, you want this telegram to go to Hollywood, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see if I can read it. Look, just get it off, will you, please? Mister, if I can't read it, I can't send it. Uh, Marcus Harris, Excelsior Studios, have terrific stunt to save Joan of Arc. Wire $10,000 immediately, Miners Bank and Trust Company. Uh, that's just a block down yes, the street. Yes, I know you... where it is. Uh, just go on. Right? Oh, oh, you, you know. Uh, uh, must have it by noon. It will pay back $10 million gross for picture. Dunigan in great form. That's Dunig uh, Dunigan. Oh, Dunigan. Dunigan. Dun Dunigan in great form. Dunigan is still world's greatest press agent. Regards Dunigan. Who's Dunigan? I am. You don't say. Here, here's five bucks. Now keep the change. Oh, thanks. And phone me at this number in Coal Town as soon as the answer comes through. Ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I'll sure like to see that return message. Yes, and so will I. But uh, just the two of us, do you understand? That's why I didn't phone it in from Coal Town. There you say. What's that? Them bells. <laughs> Church bells. Sounds like they're coming from Coal Town. Yeah, right on the dot. Eight o'clock. Huh? Sound beautiful, don't they? Sounds like all the churches in Coal Town. Something must have happened. That's right, partner. Something must have happened. I'm sorry I was so long getting back to the hotel, but I've uh, been over at Nanticoke. I'm Todd Jones, Associated Press. Oh, yeah. Tanner, Nanticoke Journal. And I'm Briggs, Wilkes-Barre's son. Now, would you mind telling us what this is all about? These bells? Yeah, this whole town is standing on its ear. Nobody seems to know why they're ringing. Well, I'm, I'm a little surprised, gentlemen. I, I didn't think anyone outside of Coal Town would be interested. Uh, this Olga Treskovna, who is she? She's an actress. A great actress, gentlemen. She died ten days ago in Hollywood. Well, Hollywood star, huh? What, what pictures? Well, as a matter of fact, she just finished Joan of Arc. Hey, wait a minute. I thought I recognized you. You're Bill Dunnigan, aren't you? That's right. Bill Dunnigan, super-duper press agent. Bells, huh? This isn't a news story. It's a publicity oh, story. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait Did wait a Marcus minute. Harris ever hear of paid advertising? Okay, boys. I'll admit I was trying to pull a fast one, but not for the reasons you're thinking. Hey, I'll... Uh, how about a bottle of scotch and some glasses? Sure, right away, Mr. Donegan. Everything I've told you is true, as far as it went. How about listening to the whole story? At least until the bottle runs out. The AP doesn't print publicity stories, Donegan. What I want to know is who's paying for three days and nights of bell ringing? I am. With the aid of four bad checks which I have sinfully given the trusting clergy of Coal Town, including Father Spinsky of St. Leo's. I've wired Marcus Harris for $10,000. If he sends it, fine. If he doesn't... Our next session will be in the Coal Town Jail. Well, why wouldn't he send it? A gag like this? Because when Olga died, Harris decided not to release the picture. I'm doing all this on my own. I figured that ringing the bells would be news. That with any luck, it'd cause so much talk that Harris would have to release the picture. And uh, what's your interest in the picture, Dunnigan? Mine? I knew Olga. I don't want to see her talent buried. She died for it. You want to hear why she felt it was worth dying for? Go ahead. I can't get a train for an hour. Well, the day she finished the picture, Olga collapsed. The next morning at daybreak, the hospital sent for me. Hello, Bill. Hello, baby. Bill. Bill, will you promise me something? Sure, sure, anything. I want... I want to be buried in Cold Town from St. Michael's Church. Olga, please don't talk like that. 
And I want them to ring the bell for me. They didn't ring it for my father. Don't forget, St. Michael's. Bill, the picture, is it really good? It's wonderful. You're great in it, Olga. I hope it's true. Because I didn't play Joan alone. A lot of people played her. People you've never seen or heard. My father and all the other poor, sad people of Cold Town. You'd better not talk, baby. But I, I want you to know and remember why I did it. Why I kept on till this happened. It's because all those poor people, the people I came from, have hopes and dreams that never get a chance. They just work and die, and all the nice things inside of them never come out. And Bill, I came out of them. When they hear me, they, they'll know it's their own heart speaking. And when they see my name shining in all the theaters, it'll be something of their shining. Oh, Bill, I'm so happy. I... I did my job. Olga. Olga. Chicago Times by Associated Press. Dead movie star honored by unique ceremony in Pennsylvania town. Wilkes-Barre's son, Bell's ring tribute to Pennsylvania movie star. Bell. 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 Dying wish of Hollywood star fulfilled. Do you like them, Olga? They're ringing your name, baby. Throughout the town, throughout the state, throughout the nation. Hello? Uh, this is the desk clerk, Mr. Dunnigan. Father Spinsky is here in the lobby, sir. Father Spinsky, huh? Eh? Uh, has the telegraph office called me yet? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Not yet. Okay, uh, you tell him I'll be right down. And I don't think you realize, Mr. Dunnigan, what a stir all this has created. Oh, I think I have an idea, Father Spinsky. Why, they tell me the entire nation has heard about the bells, the newspapers, radio. Anyway, as far as Coal Town is concerned, it seems everyone wants to attend services for Miss Truscovna. That's fine, Father. And it's obvious St. Michael's Church couldn't possibly accommodate them all. Bill. Bill. Oh, good morning, Father Paul. Bill, uh, the most unusual thing has happened. I mean, just a little while ago, over a hundred people, they came to view the coffin and they stayed for Mass. All of them in my church. Exactly, Father Paul. I was just telling Mr. Dunnigan, your little church will be greatly overtaxed. Why, the sightseers are flooding the town already. Mr. Dunnigan, I'm sure you'll agree it would be far wiser to move Olga Traskovna to St. Leo's Church and let us conduct the service. Uh, perhaps it would be better, Bill. No, Father Paul. Olga's going to be buried from St. Michael's. I, I had hoped not to be forced into this position, Mr. Dunnigan. I came here to be of service, however. At Mr. Orloff's suggestion, I wired your bank regarding the check you gave me for ringing the bells of St. Leo's. Oh. They tell me the check is worthless. Well, if you'll just give me a little time, it'll be covered, I Father. I shall phone your bank at noon. If the money is not in your account, our bells will stop ringing. And I shall inform my fellow pastors of your swindle. Good day, Mr. Dunnigan. Till noon, he said. Three hours. You know, Bill, St. Leo's is a very fine church. And Father Spinsky is really a very good man. You mean run out in St. Michael's? No, Father. Uh, Father, uh, how much is the fare to Nanticoke? Why, well, it's ten cents. Well, a daughter, a dollar ought to cover it then, huh? But I don't understand, Bill. Look, Father, don't make it too difficult, will you? I'm putting the bite on you for a buck. Oh, <laughs> oh of course, here. Uh, thanks. Oh, well, will that be enough? Well, not quite. I need about 4,000 more, but I may be able to pick it up in Nanny Coke. I'll see you later. Ah, she's coming in now, Mr. Dunnigan. Yep, yep, it, it, it's from Hollywood. Well, all what right. does it say? What does it say? Uh, have sent $5,000 as requested. Huh. Cut you down, didn't they? I expected it. Uh, what else does it say? Uh, money is settlement in full for your unexpired contract. Never mind about saving picture. My decision still stands, uh, signed Harris. Oh, uh, thanks. Oh, if there should be any other wires, you can phone me at the Coal Town Hotel. Yes, sir. Uh, go in there now, are you? Yeah, right from the bank. I've got a little session coming up with some newspaper reporters. 
Okay. So Harris came through with the money, huh? Yeah, but he's still not sold on releasing the picture. I need something big, boys. I've got to get him boiling over. If we could only get some new angle to hand your papers. Well, the bells are still ringing. Yeah, but that's no longer news breaks. We've got to cook up some fresh headlines. Well, boys, you can all calm down. The uh, party's over. What's the matter, Tanner? Well, I've just seen Watson. Who's Watson? The president of the coal mines, that's all. Biggest man in town and the maddest. The miners aren't working. They're all steamed up over the bells. Well, Watson can't stop the bells, can he? No, I think he can, Bill. Well, there must be somebody more important than Watson. Well, the governor, maybe. And there's always the president. The governor, that's it. Any of you boys know him? Well, I don't know the governor, Donegan, but I know his secretary. It's my wife's cousin. Grab a phone, then put a call in for him. If the gover- governor should issue a proclamation, even Watson would have to shut up. I thought you'd like to see the newspapers, Mr. Harris. Take a look at this. Headlines, too. Pennsylvania governor issues proclamation. All denominations to observe Star's funeral. Now here's the globe. Nationwide mourning accorded Olga. And you know what the journal says? Now never mind, never mind. I've never seen a campaign like this in all my born days. Too bad it's all for nothing. For nothing? I just this minute hung up the phone. Genevieve James is available. She wants to do Joan of Arc. Well, that is news, isn't it? You know, Dolan, I was almost hoping we could go ahead as Dunnigan wanted. But naturally, this changes everything. We'll remake the picture with Genevieve James. I'll get a telegram off to Dunnigan right away. And what's that telegram, Bill? From Hollywood, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's from Hollywood. Marcus Harris? Uh, no, 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 it's another studio. They, uh, they want to hire me. They think I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to get some sleep. Coming up? No, I, I think I'll go for a walk. Good night, boys. And uh, thanks for a swell fight. Good night, Anytime. Anytime. Well, baby, the bells are still ringing. And your star up there is still shining. But I didn't do so good, baby. They're going to remake the picture. So you can quit shining. It's no dice. I've let you down. Way down. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of The Miracle of the Bells. Our guest tonight, Paramount starlet Jean Ruth, is just 20 years old and already an accomplished actress and dancer. I understand, Jean, you've spent almost as many years in the theater as you have birthdays. Yes, Mr. Keeley. Both of my parents have been in show business nearly all their lives, so I was literally raised in the theater. And now you're well on your way to a movie career. Does the picture business come up to your expectations? It's even more fascinating than I'd hoped for. Take last Wednesday night's premiere of The Emperor Waltz. It was such fun seeing all those famous stars. And the picture. I got a special thrill out of that because I saw so much of the actual filming. And besides, Bing Crosby has one of his most romantic roles in The Emperor Waltz. Wasn't he terrific? I love those scenes where he sang to Joan Fontaine. (laughs) Well, evidently Joan loved them too. Because every time Bing sang to her, she literally wilted into his arms. (laughs) I saw you, Mr. Kennedy, at the premiere. You were applauding like mad. I had a wonderful time, all right. Remember that scene where Bing and Joan are in the canoe? Oh, that was beautiful. And in Technicolor, Joan looked simply dazzling. That brilliant sunlight was a test for any star's complexion. Try this fine white soap. You'll enjoy its rich, creamy lather, its delicate flower-like perfume. Here's your producer, Mr. Keeley. Our curtain rises on the third act of The Miracle of the Bell, starring Fred McMurray as Bill Dunnigan, Valley as Olga, and Frank Sinatra as Father Paul. Marcus Harris, the producer, has decided to remake Joan of Arc, 
and Bill Dunnigan's frantic efforts to bring Olga before the world have failed. But in Coal Town, the bells still ring out, and in the humble little church of St. Michael, the funeral service is about to begin. Never before has the church been so crowded, and outside, great throngs struggle to get in. Then, suddenly, within the church, a strange sound is heard, a rumble almost like a distant earthquake. Transfix the people stare before them, for the holy statues around the altar are moving. The statue of St. Michael, the statue of Mary, are turning. Until now, they face the coffin of Olga Treskovna. They're moving. The statues, look at them, they're moving. The statues are turning. Statues. They're turning toward her. They're looking at her coffin. It's a miracle. A miracle. They're looking at her coffin. Excuse me. Excuse me, please. You're, you're the sexton, aren't you? Where is he? Where is Father Paul? He, he went down there, Mr. Dunnigan, down to the basement. Father Paul. Father Paul. I'm here, Bill. Father Paul, I, I saw it. I was in the back of the church when it happened. I, I saw the statues turn. Yes, I know, Bill. That's why I came down here. Look, Father Paul, I started this thing. I started the bells ringing as a gag to get them to release Olga's picture. But I didn't do that upstairs, so help me, I had nothing to do with it. I know, Bill, I know. The statues turned by themselves. They turned and looked at Olga. Look, Bill, look at this post. You see, the ground is broken around this post. What? The ground, Bill, it's broken, and all the way across to the base of the other post. The statues are directly above these posts, and the posts support the statues, Bill. Are, are you trying to knock out the miracle? There wasn't any miracle. You see, there are a lot of old mine shafts under here, and the earth isn't too solid. The movement of the two posts made the statues turn, Bill. That's it, huh? Yes. I rushed down here because I was worried about the flooring of the church. All those people up there, why, our floor isn't used to such crowds. What are you going to do, Father Paul? Why, I'm going to tell them the truth. You know the truth? Yes, Bill. Father, wait. I must tell them, Bill. It's my duty. It's your duty to take the light out of their faces, is it, Father? I saw them when it happened. I saw those poor, bitter faces shining as if someone had turned a light on inside them. And I heard them praying and giving thanks. And now you're going up and tell them it was nothing but a couple of basement pillars and a piece of broken ground. Bill, you don't seem to understand. I... Look, Father, I'm not thinking of putting over a movie now. Whoever turned those statues wasn't trying to sell a picture for Marcus Harris. I tell you, Father, God was trying to say, life's all right. It's not as bad as it seems. And I'm up here watching and trying to help. And even if he didn't say it, Father, can't you see it's in their hearts now? It'll go out all over the world. And if God doesn't speak like that out of heaven, he'll be speaking out of people's hearts. And what's the difference where he speaks from? Your job isn't to hide his word, is it? No, Bill, it, it isn't to hide his word. The saints came to Joan of Arc because she wanted to help someone, the people of France. Olga wanted to help someone just as much, the people of Coal Town. Give her the chance, Father Paul. Come with me, Bill. We'll go up now. My... My dear friends... Something strange and wonderful has happened. The faces of the Blessed Virgin and St. Michael have have turned to look on one who lies among us in a coffin. I will not speak of what has made the statues turn. Others will tell you the answer to that later. I speak to you of no other miracle than the miracle of the Olga Trakis of the world, of those who live and dream only to bring heaven into our lives, even if it is no more than a, a smile of fellowship or a moment of beauty. Olga died for this, for the beauty and the tired and lonely hearts of her people. Let us pray for her. In nomine Patri et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, in Joibur Altari Dei.
Mr. Harris, but something tremendous has happened. There's a mob of newspaper reporters out there, and they want What's you to... What's happened? What are you talking about? The miracle, Mr. Harris. What miracle? In Coal Town. A miracle has happened to Olga Triscolton. I won't hear such bunk. It's sacrilegious. And if Dunnigan thinks it he It isn't can... Dunnigan. Two huge statues at the altar turned to look at Olga in her coffin. What do you mean it isn't Dunnigan? Do you think for one moment the Almighty is interested in selling my movies? And you believe it? The whole country believes it, Mr. Harris. This time, Dunnigan's gone a little too far. When a press agent starts fooling the people about religion, I'm through with him. But the statues turned, Marcus. Hundreds of people saw them turn. Then he paid somebody to have them turn. Don't you believe in miracles, Marcus? You just made a picture about one, Joan of Arc. Yes, I believe in miracles. I was brought up to believe in God and in miracles. But I won't stand for press agent miracles. Reporters, huh? Fine. I'll tell them Bill Dunnigan's the biggest faker in America. I... I've uh, turned on your radio, Mr. Harris. Can you listen in for just a moment? They're talking about it on the radio. Turn it up, Eddie. All right, Marcus. Listen. The will be that of the distinguished correspondent Lawrence Hunter here in Coal Town to report on this amazing happening. The whole country is asking, did a miracle happen in Coal Town? But here, nobody asks that question. Every man, woman, and child believes that the grace of God has touched them. To them, a miracle has happened. Something so wondrous that it has torn the bitterness and the doubts from the hearts of the people and brought them back to God. Whether this is a miracle or not is up to the church authorities to decide. But I do know this. When Olga Treskovna was brought home, a wonderful thing happened. And everyone here is convinced that somehow divine providence is blessing Coal Town and the people in it. What a day this has been, Bill. What a wonderful day. Look at those telegrams on my desk. How am I ever going to answer them all? And tomorrow there'll be more. You don't answer them, Father Paul. You get a secretary. She answers them. Oh, no, no. They were written to me. Look, we are being given a new organ by Mr. Watson. Others are giving us a new roof, stained glass windows, and look, Bill, all this money for the poor. And the world has come to St. Michael's to pray. I must thank you, Bill. Thank me. Isn't that a little funny coming from you? You mean you still believe in the miracle? I've been standing in the church most of the day, Father. I haven't tried to plant one line of newspaper copy. Do you remember when I told you how I couldn't tell Olga what I felt? Well, this is the second time in my life that I've been dumb. I can't tell the world about it. That's why I know it's real. Because I'm no good at selling anything that's real. Well, I, I guess I'm through here. Through? Oh, no, Bill. No, Bill. You're just beginning. Marcus. Bill, I'm happy to see you. Hello, Marcus. Hello, Dolan. Father, this is Mr. Harris and Mr. Dolan, straight from Hollywood. By special plane. I'm very glad to know you. Father, Bill, I'm a man who knows when he's licked. You win. You, Bill, and Father Paul, St. Michael, Olga, and a couple of statues. I've decided to release the picture as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, Marcus. We're going to put Olga Treskovna in pictures in every city in the country... And I'll tell you what she's going to do. Olga's going to build a hospital for Coal Town, the best that money can buy, a clinic for her people, for the study of this disease from which she died, so that someday there will be no such disease and people won't be dying from it because Olga Treskovna died for them, worked and died for them. This is a great thing you're doing, Mr. Harris. It's beyond anything any of us has dreamed. Maybe. I, I don't know how all this started, but... In my religion, when something happens that makes the world a little better than it was before, we know that God has had something to do with it, and we don't ask questions. In my religion, too, Mr. Harris. And beyond, when they hear me, they'll know it's their own heart speaking. And when they see my name shining in all the theaters, it'll be something of their shining. I'm so happy, Bill. I did my job. I can't imagine a better Memorial Day tribute to our audience than the Miracle of the Bells. And our thanks go now to the stars who made tonight's play such an unforgettable event. Fred McMurray, Valley, and Frank Sinatra. 
Fred, you just got back in time from the Chicago premiere of the picture. That's right, Bill. Uh, Frank and I both were there. And I understand it was a sellout. Yes, uh, Mr. Keeley, which was mighty gratifying since the proceeds went to the National Cancer Drive. And where were you, Valley, during all this? Working at the studio. But I wish I could have been there. Well, at least we had you for the radio premiere. And it's a great pleasure having you back so soon again on Lux. Well, it's a pleasure for me, Mr. Keeley. I love radio. And I'd say radio loves you, and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Alita, uh, you've been in this country such a short time. How did you learn to speak English so well? Oh, I have a good voice coach. And I go to movies a lot. Go to movies, huh? I wish I could have studied English that way. <laughs> <laughs> say, you know, if you don't watch out, Alita, you're going to have a lot of English students playing hooky. <laughs> Well, I'm sure, Valley, many actresses could learn a lot by seeing your excellent performance in the role of Mrs. Paradine in David O. Selznick's production, The Paradine Case. Yeah, that was really a thrilling picture you made with Gregory Peck, Lita. Yes, and I like those typical Alfred Hitchcock touches. You all ought to be proud of it, you all. And I'm not surprised, Valley, <laughs> at the success of your American pictures after your many, many screen hits in Italy. But tell me, do the screen stars of Italy depend on Lux soap as they do in this country? Well, every actress knows how important a good soap is to her complexion, Mr. Keeley. Mr. Keeley, what's Lux presenting next week? Next Monday night, we bring our audience a spine-thrilling story of the West with Columbia Pictures' current hit, Relentless. And our stars are Robert Young in his original exciting screen role and the lovely Claire Trevor for romantic interest. A mighty exciting picture, Bill. Yes, and as its title implies, an action-packed story of the chase in which an innocent man relentlessly pursues the murderer of whose crime he's accused. That ought to, be, ought to keep the audience in plenty of suspense, Bill. We'll be listening. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thanks for brightening our holiday. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Young and Claire Trevor in Relentless. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Today, thousands of alert young women who are high school or college graduates are choosing the career of nursing. The student nurse receives invaluable education that can qualify her for a score of useful, profitable jobs. If you can qualify for the career of student nurse, go to your nearest hospital tomorrow for full information. Fred McMurray will soon be seen in the Nasser production, Innocent Affair. Frank Sinatra appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Irving Berlin's Technicolor musical, Easter Parade, starring Judy Garland and Fred Astaire. Heard in our cast tonight were William Johnstone as Marcus Harris, Herbert Butterfield as Orloff, and Veronica Pataki as Klovna. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Relentless with Robert Young and Claire Trevor. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>